This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Warning, this video is full of spoilers for Avengers Endgame, especially the end of Avengers Endgame. If you haven't seen Endgame, add this video to your watch later list, subscribe to the channel, and come back once you've seen it. Also, there isn't a whole lot of footage from Endgame available, so use your imagination when you're watching this video. Let me be crystal clear right up front. The moment in Endgame where Captain Marvel takes the Iron Gauntlet from Spider-Man and is then surrounded by a group of MCU female super superheroes was amazing. Seriously, seeing all of them together brought a tear to my eye. I was already crying pretty much from the hammer pit, but that moment was amazing. However, having seen it a few times, I don't think Carol was the right character to take the Iron Gauntlet to the end of the line. I think there was another character who would have been a better fit in pretty much every way. So if I could make one small change to Avengers Endgame, it would be this. A different character would have taken the gauntlet. Which one? I'll get to that. But first, I want to walk through why I don't think Captain Marvel Marvel was the right choice. Again, I want to make it really clear that I loved what will probably go down as the A-Force moment and everything it represents. For people who don't know, A-Force is a comic from the Secret Wars event a few years back where many of the female Marvel heroes were on a team together. This felt a lot like that, and I loved it. I'm also not one of those guys who makes a video a day about why Brie Larson throws puppies into the river. This isn't that. This is more of an examination of the moment. So let's set the scene. Thanos pulls a long shanks and shoots his own troops because Scarlet Witch is about to rip him in half. This knocks Peter out of the sky and he drops the Iron Gauntlet. And before everyone is lasered to death, the heroes are saved by the cavalry, or should I say, Carolvalry. Okay, listen, Carol flies over to Peter, he introduces himself because sure, Carol says hi and takes the gauntlet. Peter sees the army standing between Carol and the van and asks, how are you gonna make it through all them? Which brings us to my first issue. Carol just flew through Thanos' entire ship with no issue whatsoever. If she can do that to the ship, a couple hundred goons shouldn't be an issue. And that deflates what should be some interesting tension. This is the last leg of our fight. We should see this as a big obstacle, but it isn't for Carol. And since this isn't that difficult, there isn't a great justification for the A-Force assembling. Again, it's great, but Carol objectively does not need them. That's her whole thing. Carol is a one-woman Avengers. She could do this herself. And that is proven by the fact that in the original movie, Carol just flies by the A-Force as they kill baddies. They don't really seem to be clearing a path. Yeah, there is one bit where Shuri, Rescue, and Wasp blast Thanos out of the way. Wow, what a sentence. 2019 is amazing. But that also doesn't seem like something Carol couldn't have just done by herself. The other reason why I don't love Carol being the last leg of the Gauntlet Relay has to do with the thematic significance of this mission. Sending the gauntlet back in time and thwarting Thanos' plan is the literal endgame of this entire saga. This is a huge deal. Shouldn't the character who has that responsibility on their shoulders be tied to the saga in some meaningful way? Wouldn't it be poetic if Thanos is defeated by the characters who he has hurt the most? But Captain Marvel is probably the single character in this movie who is the least connected to Thanos. Carol doesn't seem to know much about him. She wasn't present for the snap. Yeah, her friend Nick Fury was dusted, but we never see her mourn for him. There is no character less suited to be a huge part of killing Thanos than Carol. And I'm not saying she shouldn't be there. I'm just saying this should not be her moment. So then who takes the Iron Gauntlet? I think this is an easy one. And here's how I would rewrite the scene. Peter gets knocked down. The gauntlet falls near Peter. Peter reaches for it, but then someone picks up the gauntlet. Peter opens his eyes and sees Nebula. She tells Peter, I'll take it. Peter looks down the battlefield and sees a humongous army. How are you going to get past all that? A completely legitimate question since she is Nebula. And then Gamora walks over and says she'll have help. So now both, and I'm air quoting here, daughters of Thanos are going to bring the Iron Gauntlet the rest of the way to defeat Thanos. Way more meaningful. But it's not over because then Okoye walks over and says you're going to need more help than that. And as Okoye says that, the rest of the female 
heroes come to Nebula's side. Now, Nebula, a character who was bred her entire life to compete with a powerful woman, is going to be supported by a group of powerful women. Carol drops in and says, I'll keep him busy, referring to Thanos. And then they all charge at Thanos' army together. So this isn't just a clip of individual heroes killing goons while Captain Marvel charges forward on her own. Nebula and Gamora are navigating the battlefield and being protected by the A-Force. And this frees up Captain Marvel for a fun solo fight with Thanos. He has no stones. It's just a fist fight like something out of Dragon Ball Z. She's punching him through walls. He's jumping back and using his double buster sword to deflect her attacks. It's awesome. While that's going on, Nebula and Gamora are getting closer to the van. And then, out of the corner of his eye, Thanos sees Nebula. And he sees the Iron Gauntlet in her hands. But then he gets confused. Nebula was supposed to be bringing the gauntlet to him. Why is she running towards the van? And then, Nebula looks back and sees Thanos. And Nebula shoots Thanos the most vicious of looks. And Thanos realizes what's happening. This isn't his Nebula. This is the other Nebula. The Nebula that escaped his control and his abuse and made friends and found a family and was able to move past Thanos. And she is holding the gauntlet. The entire gauntlet. Remember, this Thanos hasn't even collected a single stone outside of the scepter, which he doesn't have anymore. This is it. And there it goes. In the arms of the person he took the most from. Thanos feels this failure. And it makes him furious. See, Infinity War demonstrated that Nebula is really the only character that makes Thanos angry. Like, really angry. It's easy to take for granted how calm Thanos is during Infinity War. He's going through the motions. Beating the Avengers and Guardians of the Galaxy to death is merely a formality at this point. That is, until Nebula shows up. She makes Thanos lose his cool. Nebula gets under Thanos' skin. And that catapults us into the end of the fight. Thanos throws his sword, destroys the van, and the rest of the fight goes the same way as it does in the original movie. But look at what Nebula taking the gauntlet the rest of the way represents. Endgame might as well have been Nebula's movie. It's an Avengers movie, so it's an Iron Man movie, but I would argue that it's Nebula's movie as much as it is Captain America's, maybe more than Thor. And Nebula's journey through these movies has been leading her to this point, a fight over the Infinity Stones. But the circumstances of that fight have changed since we first met Nebula. In Guardians 1, Nebula is a henchman of Thanos, tasked with collecting the Infinity Stones so that Thanos could achieve the snap. She was loyal to Thanos, but only really because of fear and scorn. But over the course of these movies, Nebula has grown. In Guardians 1, Nebula leaves Ronin because she doesn't believe in what he's doing. Nebula wants to do her own thing. Then in Guardians 2, Nebula and Gamora reconcile. We learn that Thanos forced Nebula and Gamora to fight and tortured Nebula when she lost to Gamora, which made Nebula hate Gamora, but really Nebula only wanted a sister. And at the end of Guardians 2, Nebula is determined to kill her real enemy, Thanos. The time Nebula has spent with Gamora has made Nebula do a complete 180, and that 180 would be perfectly represented by having this movie end, with Nebula collecting the Infinity Stones, like Thanos always wanted her to, but because of her character growth, working with the heroes, and playing an integral part in keeping the stones away from Thanos. Two other small things. First, comic fans may recognize that Nebula holding the gauntlet feels like a reference to how she wields the gauntlet in the Infinity Gauntlet comic. In that comic, Nebula steals a full gauntlet from Thanos and goes mad with power. This moment would not only not at that moment, but contrast comic and film Nebula. Film Nebula has full control of the Infinity Stones and the ability to use them, but she also has a family that she cares about, so she does the right thing. One last fun thing. My, hey, maybe, who knows, this could have maybe been in the script at some point. If the film plays out the way I'm describing, the events would go as follows. Nebula takes the gauntlet. Thanos destroys the van. Nebula drops the gauntlet. Thanos goes for the gauntlet. Is stopped by Thor and Cap. Thanos beats them and takes the gauntlet. Is briefly stopped by Captain Marvel. And ultimately, Tony steals the stones and makes his own gauntlet. So, the last two non-Thanos characters to hold the gauntlet are Nebula and Tony. And a lot of people have made the comparison that at the end of this movie, the gauntlet functions as a football. The characters are running with the gauntlet, passing it to one another, moving the gauntlet down the field into enemy territory. So when you think about it like that, that means Endgame would have ended the 
same way it began, with Tony, Nebula, and a football. Speaking of football, I recently watched the most fascinating documentary on CuriosityStream called Bounce, How the Ball Taught the World to Play. It tells the story of how sports have evolved throughout time and what they've meant to different cultures, gets into how American football spun off of sports like rugby and soccer or football or whatever you want to call it. And trust me, the documentary is very interesting, even if you don't care about the sports themselves. And you can find Bounce and thousands of other documentaries on this video sponsor, CuriosityStream. Curiosity Stream was started by the founder of the Discovery Channel. It's a subscription service that offers over 2,400 documentaries and nonfiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. And you can get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And the first 30 days are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com Nando and use the promo code Nando during the sign up process. The link is in the episode description. As always, thank you to everyone who continues to support the channel on Patreon. You guys are the best. If you want to see your names up here, get access to videos early, other cool stuff, throw in literally any amount of money at patreon.com slash nandovmovies. You have no idea how much I appreciate it. And also, I have to thank everybody who watched and who liked and shared and also made a One Marvelous Scene video. I could not believe how many people were making their own videos and tweeting them to me and emailing them to me. I'm sure a lot of them fell through the cracks because I've been super busy for the last couple of days, but the ones that I have seen, the ones that I put on the playlist are really, really excellent. So if you haven't seen it in a while, I would recommend going to the playlist now, maybe skipping past the ones from the people that were on it originally and just looking at some of the other ones. Find a scene that you know that you're already kind of familiar with and then watch that video because you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff there, a lot of different perspectives from a lot of different creators. It's super cool. As always, listen to my podcast, Mostly Nitpicking. Every week, me and my co-host DJ pick apart a piece of pop culture by looking exclusively at the details. This week, we're doing Avengers Endgame. I'm going to record that podcast very soon. Also, me, DJ, and friend of the show and co-host of that show, Chris Diggins, do a show called After After the Thrones, where we talk about Game of Thrones. It's on the same feed as Mostly Nitpicking. So if you watch Game of Thrones and you listen to Mostly Nitpicking, give those a look. Uh, The next episode, I'm sure, is going to be very interesting. And as always, follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash nandovmovies. It's where I post updates about videos and podcasts and whatever else it is that I'm doing. That's all I got. I'll see you next time.